Stay hungry, stay foolish. Discover your strengths, live your dreams, let go of fear. Discover your true sense of purpose, live the life you've only imagined. Maximize your creative potential, find success with dignity, deal with personal crises. Why does the thrill of soaring begin with the fear of falling? How can you overcome that fear and dare to live? Today's guest will share some solutions. He has spent over 30 years working with leaders aligning their organizations to inspire individuals, teams, and hundreds or even thousands of people in various settings. He has captured his insights as an entrepreneur, a speaker, an author, a film producer to share the powerful transformation that occurs when people share a common purpose. He has discovered that the key to real growth and profitability is purposeful leaders who would build inspiring organizations and iconic brands. His mission is straightforward and clear, to provide people with the knowledge, skills, and inspiration to perform at their best. He is the author of the best-selling books, The Eagle's Secret, Success Strategies for Thriving at Work and in Life, The Push, Unleashing the Power of Encouragement, My Sacred Journey Through Cancer. His co-authored book, Be Your Own Brand, also a bestseller, and is now used by many business schools to address the importance of building a strong personal brand. His latest book is Mark of an Eagle, How Your Life Changes the World. It is the third in the Eagle trilogy. Also an award-winning producer, he has produced two highly praised inspirational films, The Power of Purpose and If I Were Brave. We welcome author of today's focus, Even Eagles Need a Push, Learning to Soar in a Changing World. David McNally, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aidan. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. This book has been an absolute smash hit. We were talking about it before the show. I was telling you that it is so relevant today in this changing world, rapidly changing world. It's an exemplified by a beautiful poem that you opened the book with. And it'd be an honor if you would, might recite that poem to open the show today. Yes, I'd love to. So here we go. The eagle gently coaxed her offspring toward the edge of the nest. Her heart quivered with conflicting emotions as she felt their resistance to her persistent nudging. Why does the thrill of soaring have to begin with the fear of falling, she thought. This ageless question was still unanswered for her. As in the tradition of the species, her nest was located high on the shelf of a sheer rock face. Below, there was nothing but air to support the wings of each child. Is it possible that this time it will not work, she thought? Despite her fears, the eagle knew it was time. Her parental mission was all but complete. There remained one final task, the push. The eagle drew courage from an innate wisdom. Until her children discovered their wings, there was no purpose for their lives. Until they learned how to soar, they would fail to understand the privilege it was to have been born an eagle. The push was the greatest gift she had to offer. It was her supreme act of love. And so by one by one, she pushed them and they flew. Beautiful, David. It's such a beautiful poem. As a parent, it's inspiring, but also I think it goes much deeper than that. And you dedicate this book in the introduction to the idea of confidence. Yes, I do. And it comes from something that really occurred to me when my eldest daughter was getting her driver's license at 16 years of age. And the driving instructor, after seeing my trepidation, said, uh, Mr. McNally, he said, don't uh, worry about your daughter. She has a tremendous amount of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I thought about that and I said to myself, well, I hope she's not overly confident as all parents do, right? When their children are first starting to drive. I dwelled on that and I thought how powerful the whole notion of confidence was at any time in our lives, Aiden, that even as we get older and we look to do new things in our lives, that it's that confidence factor that is so important. Now, 
I'd like to define confidence in two ways. Number one, confidence is uh, the ability to know that no matter what challenges life presents, you know that you can handle them. That's a tremendous level of confidence, but it's also the confidence and the willingness to take the risks that we need to take if we are to live the lives we imagine. That's what I really mean by confidence. And you tell us that that success is a realization that life is about growing. I love that definition of success. For many people, it means different things. It really resonated with me that it's a realization that life is about growing and evolving and changing. Well, it is. Aidan, if you think about our lives, we actually live life at a feeling level, right? Most of us, we not most of us, all of us actually want to feel good about our lives and that we want to feel good during the day. Now, life throws out some, uh, as we say in the United States, curveballs. It sends us challenges and and that. And there are many times in our lives where these challenges are things that are very sad. And sadness is a, a very, very valid feeling. Apart from those things that come at us that are unexpected, we can do a lot to be able to create the kind of feelings that we want. And when I mean that, I'm talking about feeling engaged by our work. Uh, engaged in our relationships, those sort of feelings where we just say, you know, I'm, I'm participating in life at the highest level that I can. So if you look at it that way, then what you know is this, feel good about life and to have at least four to five days out of seven that you are genuinely feeling great. Then it's about the fact that you are continuing to learn and to grow as a human being, that that's what your life is about, right? In other words, looking to the future and in this continual process of creating. I like to make that distinction between being creative. We're all creative, but it's about always moving towards things that we look forward to so that we are engaged in our lives in a full way. Much like you say, our lives is guided by our feelings equally thinking can actually place boundaries around ourselves. The most critical thing that we can do, Aiden, is to take charge of that thinking, to take charge of our thoughts. One of the exercises that I do, and I've had this practice, and it is a practice for over 40 years, Aiden, is that I am no different to any other human being. You know, having five children and now grandchildren in my life, you know, my thoughts can wander all over the place. Negativity can seep into my life and my thinking like anybody else. I loved what someone said to me a while ago when they said they wake up in the middle of the nights and they have to deal with their bully thoughts, the thoughts that bully us, right? So my practice every morning is to sit down, right? and to just ground myself. It's a kind of a meditation, if you like, but I ground myself in, in the moment and in the day in saying, okay, let's take a look at all of those bully thoughts that may be going around in your head, and now let's look at the reality of them and say, are they real or are they just some sort of a fantasy or concern that you have about something in the future that probably will never, ever happen? So I, I bring all my thoughts and I align them towards the positive. I start thinking about, you know, okay, what do I want this day ahead to be like? How can I make this day more meaningful? You know, what can I contribute to the people in my life, in my professional life and in my personal life? And I say, you've been given the gift of this day and how do you open and then use this gift wisely? But I do that, Aiden, every morning because you never get away from the fact that thoughts tend to want to bully you. You have to take charge of those thoughts and direct them towards the goals and the dreams you have for your life. Here's a thing that I find massively prevalent. Even if you got somebody to silence the inner critic, to deal with their thoughts the way you do or whoever deals with them in their certain way, whether it's through meditation or whatever it may be, Oftentimes, when the voice calms down, people don't have a desire or a wish, or they haven't thought about it yet. I found this quite a lot. When I ask people, 
you're not happy with your current situation, but what do you want to do or what do you want from this life? Oftentimes they have never thought about that. And I love the way you introduced this in the book. One of the greatest wisdom that I could possibly give to anybody is simply to look towards the end. As you get towards the end of your life, and all the studies have shown this of senior citizens, people who look back on their lives, and some of them are immersed in the most tremendous regret that they didn't fully live their lives because they wanted to believe that their lives matter. The only way you can do that, Aiden, is to make sure your life matters today. And we as human beings have so much, and I know people have probably heard this over and over again, but we have so much potential. And so we need to look at what is stopping me from moving forward to realize my potential. Uh, as you said, what are those, what are those self uh, inhibiting thoughts that are stopping me from, from putting a stake in the ground? I talk about it this way. We all live in, in a world of one day I'm gonna. Have you ever said that to yourself? One day I'm gonna? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and I ask that in, in the seminars that we do and the speeches that I give, I say to people, okay, what's on your one day I'm gonna list? And people will say to me, one day I want to go to Australia or one day I want to learn the piano or one day I'm going to do this. I say to them, listen, don't have the, and I'm very, very straightforward. Don't have the arrogance to believe that you have an infinite amount of time to do what you said that you wanted to do, because you'll end up at the end of your day saying, I never did the one thing I said I always want to do. So it begins with a step, right? So for example, I, as, uh, as you can tell, I have a little bit of an Aussie accent in me, right? And that, that's because <laughs> I grew up in Adelaide, Australia. And, um, and it's a bit mixed, this accent, but the people often say to me, oh, I've always wanted to go to Australia. And I say, why don't you? And, and they say, oh, oh, well, you know, it's a long way, right? It's a long way to get from here to there. And I say, yes, I, I, I do understand that. But if you really want to go, take a first step, you know, go to a travel agent, get online, whatever it is, get off, as we say in the U.S., off the dime, make a move forward. So whatever it is that you said you wanted to do, start with that and then take that, that small step and then take a second step. And before you know it, within 12 months, 24 months, you'll be in Sydney, you'll be in Melbourne, you'll be in Australia having a ball. That's the way you begin. Those little small steps are, are absolutely key. To come back to what you said about absolutely using up our lives and those people who die happy are the ones who die with the least regrets possible. You have a beautiful line in the book that I pulled out. It is, we were born to be thoroughly used up when we die. I love that line, man. We use everything. We leave nothing behind and we thoroughly enjoy every moment. Well, Aiden, I think you've hit a really wonderful point there because I like to say we were born also to create. We are, it's in our DNA that we are creation oriented beings. If we don't have something to look forward to, well, we're not happy, right? When you look at all the opportunities the world has to offer, then many, many people think about looking at a, a multi paneled window. Many people are looking at life through one small window pane. And if they only stepped back and took a look through the whole window, they would see this magnificent vista of things they can do, things that they could be involved with. I, I remember my, my own father who passed away a few years ago, who was, uh, comes from a very poor Scottish family, emigrated to Australia and became a very successful realtor. And he had a, he left school when he was 13 years of age. I mean, this wasn't a well educated man, but he was a man, Aiden, that was so engaged in life and even into his eighties, he got into his eighties and was honored by, by the queen for being the South Australia's longest serving volunteer. For 50 years, he volunteered and received that award in his mid eighties. And when his friends who were also in the eighties would tell him they were bored, he would say to them, how can you be bored? 
There is so much that is needed to be done in this world, and you could play a big part in that. So, Aiden, I, I inherited a lot of what I talk about, quite frankly, from my own dad's uh, attitude and enthusiasm. But it's so important, David, and you say as well, a lot of people have goals in life, and I pulled this one from the book, goals nourish the heart, but it's purpose that feeds the soul. There's no question about that. One of the ways that I started to understand the whole notion of purpose, right? Because I've achieved a lot of goals in my life, but these goals are always, you know, you achieve the goals and then it's kind of temporary, right? What, uh, how you feel about those goals. But purpose is an ongoing thing to wake up in the morning to believe that there's something important for you to do that day. Something important that you can contribute is powerful. And I got connected to this notion through a young man from Canada, a boy called Terry Fox, who at the age of 18 had lost his leg to cancer and transformed that adversity into the opportunity of raising money for cancer and ran the greatest marathon run ever in the world, actually. It was the most magnificent story. And he's actually regarded now as one of Canada's greatest heroes. Terry introduced me to the concept of purpose because when I read his story, I was reading about a young man who was ironically an average athlete, committed athlete, but he was only average in terms of talent. He was uh, like a B student. He wasn't uh, you know, an intellectual by any means, but it was the purpose of raising money for cancer and this fight against cancer that gave him enormous power. A marathon a day for five months, that's inconceivable, even if you had two good legs, Aiden, but with one leg. So the whole notion of purpose is relevant to all of us. In other words, why why do I exist? Why was I born? I wasn't born to just mark time. I was born to leave my mark. So how do I leave my mark? And it doesn't mean that I have to do something like a Terry Fox did, but every day in every way I connect with other human beings, I'm leaving my mark. Well, am I leaving a positive mark or am I leaving a negative mark? What what is the thrust of our conversations? And that's the notion of purpose, to contribute value to the world. And we all have that possibility within us. To bring that to the next point, which you talk about in the book, is oftentimes, like the inner critic, people find they find refuge in their excuses. So they become defined by their past or their mistakes or what they deem to be failures. But as you say in the book, these failures or these challenges or these obstacles are actually part of the process. And when you embrace them like that, it changes the game. And you give a beautiful metaphor of a boat in a dry dock. So many times in our lives, we need to step back and think about putting ourselves in metaphorically into kind of like a dry dock. For example, anyone who has a boat or knows anything about boats knows that they need to be taken out of the water every now and then to be serviced and to get the hull cleaned up. And the reason for that is that the hull collects a whole lot of debris and garbage on the hull of the boat. So what that does is that obviously affects the performance of the boat and it doesn't move through the water as smoothly and as cleanly. So its performance is inhibited because of, of all of this stuff that is accumulated on the hull of the boat. And I liken that to our lives over a period of time and it can actually start at a very, very young age, we accumulate garbage of people's opinions, people's thoughts. As you said, we try something and we fail at it. We determine then that because of these things have happened, that failure of something makes us a failure or what people have said about us, about our potential is true and it's not true. And we need to take the time to say, what of of all of these things, what is the garbage? What are the barnacles on the hull of my life that are stopping me to really perform to my potential? That's the metaphor that I think is so important. I love a quote that I use in the book by the famous Broadway producer, Hal Prince. He's one of the most famous producers on Broadway. And he says that anyone who hasn't had, had a failure is an amateur. (laughs) So we all, we are all 
of people, if we've tried, if we've gone out and taken risk, if we've done our best to live our si- lives as much as we can, we're going to fail. We're going to have our setbacks. I've had so many, Aiden. But if you look at them then as a learning experience and you look at it and say, okay, what did I learn from that? So that when I move forward in my life, I know I would never do that again. How am I stronger? How am I more resilient as a human being? Then failure plays a very major part in our growth and development. This is one of the reasons I think the book is so relevant today, even though it was written in the 90s. So many of today's youths or the new workforce coming into the workforce seem stricken by fear or making mistakes or the expectations upon them are so high. And when they have so much fear, they don't make any choice and they actually just go along with choices being made for them. And this is where I feel this book can really, really help, where if we can instill them with A, the confidence, like you talk about, to actually jump out of the nest, not be pushed, but also then have the courage to overcome obstacles and know they're going to come because I think this is one of the biggest things. Obstacles are part of the journey. They cannot not be. And even though they're stuck to your hole, some of them can be beneficial. And you talk about this, like our lives are almost like a boat where an engine on its own or a hull on its own or a sail on its own isn't much good. But when you stick them all together, they become a vessel that can float. Exactly. It's the sum of the parts, right? You bring it all together. And I think that's very important for your listeners to understand. Aiden, every person who is listening to you knows what they want in life, right? They really do. At the deepest level, they know what they want for their lives. Now, at a conscious level, consciously, they may be saying to themselves, I really don't know. You do know. You do know. What you don't have is the right questions to get to what you want for your life. And as you have uh, seen in the book, what I've endeavored to do is provide the questions that will allow you to get to the answers that you're looking for. Now, of course, once you've got the answers, then you need to have the courage, right? The courage to move forward. But think about the consequence if you do not move forward and get starting towards the thing that you said, the one thing I said I always wanted to do, I never did. That is such a powerful consequence. There's a wonderful Irish theologian and philosopher, uh, John O'Donohue. You know, John? Yeah. Yeah. He passed away there not so long ago. Yes. He's one of my, just one of my favorite, favorite people. And he talks about the, the fact that when he was a Catholic priest, Uh, which he was for 19 years, he would have that great privilege he talks about when people make their transition at the end of their lives. And he called it a privilege, uh, Aiden. But he said what struck him was the people that went so peacefully knowing that they had really taken charge of their lives and had lived a full life to the best of their ability. And then he was also struck by the people who he could tell were just so disappointed that they didn't fully engage and take the risks that they could have taken to live the lives they imagined for themselves. When I listen to John O'Donoghue talk about that, of course, it just validated all of the things that I personally believe and have written about. I think that's the biggest motivator in life is that the sands of time are are moving every second. and. Every second you don't start living your own dream, you're living somebody else's or you're contributing to somebody else's. And your job is to contribute to your own. And I know people, a life of service is really, really beneficial. You talk about this in the book. A life of service does not mean you have to be a servant, but it can mean something totally different for people. It's something to be great to share because I think there's a lot of misconception about what that word actually means. I think it's a very powerful point. And it brings up a fundamental principle of life that I believe in. Aiden, it's called the principle of contribution. Our success in life is in proportion to the contribution we make. So think about it in this way. The universe is held together by different planets contributing to each other, right? We are controlled by the sun and the moon controls the tide. So that's at a macro level. Let's bring it down to a very micro level, right? 
If we look at, for example, the relationships in our lives, if we look at the really deep and meaningful relationships that we have with other people, we can say, well, the reason that relationship is so important to me is because that person contributes to my life, right? They contribute something to my life in a very, very powerful way that my life would be much emptier if that person wasn't in my life. So if you look at all great relationships between people, it's because each person wants the very best for the other. In partnerships, marriages, we talk about relationships are 50-50. Well, they're really not because none of us knows where that 50% actually begins and ends, right? (laughs) It's about 100%. 100%. I'm 100% committed to you and you're 100% committed to me. And we've all been through tough times in our lives. And it's those friends that show up in our tough times that we know truly are our friends. They're the contributors. But this goes further forward. And for example, if you take someone who wants a successful career, one of the things that I'm Uh, asked to do is to speak to graduating university students here in the United States. One of the questions that inevitably come up is, how do I get a good job? One of the answers that I give them is, remember that no one wants to give you a job, give you a job. But there are many organizations out there who are looking for people who will contribute to their success. So contribution weaves its way through everything. If you want to be successful in your career, make sure that you are a contributor. I bring it down to a level that people don't even think about, and that's business itself. uh, We do a lot of work with businesses all over the world, and I get to, um, to ask the questions, what's the purpose of a business? And inevitably, people will say, I want to make money. I mean, that's what business is all about. Well, is it? Uh, I tell a funny little story of the fact, and it's a true story, that I have a second cousin in England who spent 10 years in prison for making money. You can't <laughs> make money. It's illegal, nice. right? <laughs> the police don't like that. If you look at how a business performance is reported in a newspaper, they will say, this is how much they earn. So it's about earning money. Well, how do you earn money? Well, you can't earn money in a business unless you have customers. So the purpose of a business is to create and keep customers. So actually, and ironically, the only way that you can build a loyal customer base is to make sure that you are contributing, here's the word again, contributing value on a consistent basis. The companies that go out of business forget that principle. The businesses that prosper and performance goes through the roof are the companies that are consistently looking at how they contribute value to the people they serve. It's not about being a servant or being servile. It's understanding that we are here to serve others. So that's the way I address it. It's so relevant today. And we're seeing this with businesses. The businesses, like you say, are doing well they have a great story, but it's an authentic one. They're giving back the circular economy. All these kind of buzzwords we hear have a meaning behind them. But I took something a little bit different and I'm probably on a universal level. So on a human level, because you call out the Marshall McLuhan quote on this, which is on spaceship earth, there are no passengers, only crew. So we all have to contribute it. If we're on a spaceship, there's no passengers just taking. And oftentimes the world has gone off balance a little bit and there's a lot of people taking more than giving and more con- contributing because if we reframe our mindset that way, we become huge contributors to life. It's as little as picking up a bit of litter, as little as seeing a fellow human being and contributing to them in some way to make their life a little bit better. You brought up an excellent point. It, it is the whole notion of responsibility. What are my responsibilities? What are my responsibilities to myself, to look after myself, to look after my health, to my spiritual life, my emotional life? What are my responsibilities? What are my responsibilities to the people in my life in terms of how I can contribute and give back to them in my life? 
what are my responsibilities to my employer who is giving me a paycheck every couple of weeks or whatever it might be? Uh, what is my responsibilities to my community? And, and what are my responsibilities to my country and the planet? Uh, of course, that's a, a, a fun, uh, that's a level of consciousness, Aiden, uh, that, uh, you know, a, a certain amount of people have. Uh, but they're the people that are taking us in the direction that we that we want to go, and so you, you're talking about something that is, is is quite quite critical for people to understand that every action has a consequence. As simple as you say of of seeing a piece of litter on the street and picking it up because you take pride in your environment and you take pride in in the area in which in which you live. Yes, this is Spaceship Earth, and no one can be absolved of that responsibility. And the more that we can build that consciousness out there and help people understand that, the payoff for them, actually, is to help them understand how important they are, how important their lives are, that they were born to serve a purpose it's up to them, however, to discover what that purpose is. It's a very powerful notion, but if we get into it, my gosh, there's, we would never ask the question, why am I here? We would have that answer. You must see this with your work with organizations and leaders, that an organization is often a reflection of the shadow of the leader. And if she or he has negative traits, that ripples throughout the company. And equally, if they have positive traits, they work throughout the company. Because it's the same thing. If we lead by example in life, we can influence those around us. But it takes not just one person like transformation in a company. It takes middle management, lower management, and of course, top leadership. There's so much work being done today uh, and as part of our work as well around culture, right? What is the culture of the organization? And we define culture as the sum total of the attitudes and behaviors that exist within an organization. So you have all the individual attitudes and behaviors, and then you have the uh, combination of all those that create a culture, the way that the organization operates, right? And you said something really important. That begins with leadership. What is the values of the leaders of the organization? And if you know their values, you can determine what the culture is. And culture is not a nice to have. It is the key to an effective strategy. And when you look at the culture, of, again, of truly successful organizations, and when I talk about it, I'm not talking about short-term success. I'm talking about long-term consistent success. You will find that they have a rich culture where the attitudes and behaviors within that organization are serving a specific purpose. So for example, when they have a, a mission statement or a set of values uh, stated, that's not just stated, it's lived. So it's the living of the values that the organization states that creates the culture. So there's no more important work an organization can do than examine what those values are so that leaders can lead and be committed to those values. So it's a critical one. David, I'd love to jump to the notion of forgiveness because forgiveness is often associated with religion. And you write almost a whole chapter on this and forgiving yourself and appreciating yourself, etc. And it, it can come across in life as a bit soft. And I really took time to challenge myself when I was reading this chapter to go, why am I glossing over this? And then I thought about, actually, there's incidences in my life where I have glossed over them and they're like garbage on my hull. And I took time because you give the exercises in the book and I took time to think about those. And then I took time and it was like unpeeling an onion. It was like there was one layer and I discovered something and I happily share them. I, I played professional rugby. When I retired for a long time, I was angry at myself for not having achieved more, not having played for a world 15 and these really high lofty goals I had. And it really came up for me when I was doing the forgiveness exercise. And it was really, really powerful. And I felt a bit lighter. 
you're getting into something that is so critical. Whether you look at it as the hull of your life that you're you're taking a look at the garbage, or you think about it in another way. Think about the eagle that wants to soar, but it is encumbered by a backpack, right? <laughs> it's got a backpack that is full of regrets, right? Full of stuff that maybe has not been examined. So it endeavors to take off, but this backpack, it is so much work to try to move forward and soar into the future of life. So it's a very, very courageous thing. And as you said, it's not an easy thing to go into our lives, to go back over our lives and look at some things that we've done that we're not very proud of, some things where we've hurt other people, the failures that we've had, the aspirations that have not been fulfilled, like you were talking about with your rugby, whatever it might be, but to look back at those things and do it in a very, very honest way, right? Now, of course, when I use the word forgiveness, the connotation is it's a very religious thing. It is a spiritual thing because when we're carrying stuff that is unexamined, that is causing us to not be able to move forward in the future, the spirituality part is that it's damaging our human spirit. That's what I like to say. The other thing then is to deal with it in a very real way. We cannot go back. There's nothing in the past that is possible for us to undo. It happened. We have to let go of it. So if you use the word forgiveness or you use the word let go, it doesn't make any difference. We have to let go. Now, it doesn't mean that we are not regretful, that we are not sorry, that we do not make amends to the best of our abilities. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that we understand that our lives are about today and they're about the future. We're not hiding anything. In fact, we're confronting it. And then when we've confronted it and we looked at it, then it's very, very important because this is where wisdom comes from. There's two things important about the past, Aiden. One is remembering the great things that you know that you talk about and you share about with friends, you know, and all the, the laughter that you have. And then the second thing is the wisdom that you've gained from the not so good things, right? So, so what is that wisdom? What have I learned? And out of that wisdom, I am now committed to living my life in a way that will ensure that I never, ever go back to that way of living or do those things that I did. That's the important part of dealing with the past, to unload the backpack of those regrets and those things that we've done so that we can now throw it off and then soar into the future that we imagine for ourselves. Beautiful, David. I'm going to ask you this one. If you had an elevator moment with somebody who's stuck in a rut in their career or in life or hasn't forgiven themselves, what's the one piece of advice that you might give them? I would go back and tell them, look, the purpose of your life is not to mark time. Your purpose is to leave your mark, that you are important. What you can contribute has tremendous value. And have the courage to do what you need to do to get out of the rut, right? Because the only difference between a rut and a grave, Aiden, is the depth. To get out of that rut, have that courage so that you can go out there because of you living a full life. The consequence of you living a full life, you leave a mark on the world that will be handed down from generation to generation. And David, where can people find out more about you and your work and your transformation workshops, your organizational development, etc.? Yeah, just aid and go to, simply to davidmcnally.com. They'll find out all about me on that, davidmcnally.com. They'll find out about the books, the videos, whatever they need to do. Would love to hear from anybody, of course, and I'll let you know how the show went. Just fantastic. Author of Even Eagles Need a Push, Learning to Soar in a Changing World. David McNally, it's been an honor talking to you. Thank you, Aidan. My pleasure.